Hey everyone, can you hear me okay? Uh, so, uh, I'm James George. I'm Alexander Porter. Alexander Porter has better mic placement than I do. Uh, so this was billed as a workshop, um, but it's not going to be hands-on as you can see. The room is not really set up for a workshop. So it's going to be more of a tech-focused presentation and kind of survey of the landscape of what we're just calling volumetric filmmaking. Um, specifically, how these techniques can be used um, for creating stories that go beyond what we think of film today and into new spaces, both uh, immersive as well as interactive. Um, so we'll start out with just a little bit of, of context on what's inspired us to work in this space. So uh, this is a screen flow from Apple Maps. It's a program that's kind of like Google Maps or Google Earth. It's on every laptop. It might even be on phones now. They're running OS X. And what's happening now with maps, which were used to being two-dimensional iconographic representations of space, the photography from satellites and drones and street uh, scanning has become so dense that these uh, maps have begun to spill into virtual space and become three-dimensional. So they become to look more like video games in virtual world worlds and less like uh, maps on a page. <laughs> and this is fascinating to us. Uh, Alexander having his background being in uh, photography, mine being in computer science with focus on uh, imaging and graphics. Uh, so we watch this uh, technology emerging. Uh, and we begin to notice things that are surprising or uncanny or sometimes unsettling about some of these systems. So this is a screenshot that Alexander took from Google Earth. Uh, it's a sunny day in lower Manhattan. And there's no cars on the road, which is really weird. And then if you look at the reflection in the glass, you notice that actually the street was packed with cars. And so this, what's happening here, what we notice is that these images, these maps, despite being photographic, are being systematically cleansed of imagery that would relate to any individual story, any personal history or event that was happening on that day. And that's because their, their creators, the intentions of this technology is not to do what maybe an individual photographer or filmmaker would do with this type of imagery, but it's rather to continue the lineage of cartography and make canonical documents of space. So despite having access to the, the future of imaging technology, companies like Google and Apple often will still work within a uh, utilitarian context and not provide these techniques and tools to filmmakers, artists, and people who would otherwise uh, use them to tell stories. And as a call to action, this is a, an image that's a data visualization that an intern at Facebook made actually almost 10 years ago now of mapping the, the distance relationships between people. So if there's two friends and they live in different cities, he would draw a line between those two cities on the map. And then the more uh, friend, friendships or connections that those cities shared, the brighter the line would get. And what results when viewed in mass is uh, a map of our interconnected relationships despite our physical distance. And there's no end to the amount of drama and stories that are taking place that images like this allude to. But at this scale, we can't really see that. So how can photographers and filmmakers who are used to taking, taking pictures of relationships and, and events that happen in our physical space begin to engage with the new landscape of human interaction. And so that's what we're trying to do at Scatter. So our studio, uh, it's defined as an immersive media studio, and uh, we are trying to contextualize and use and harness this, these new technologies and new imaging uh, possibilities to tell these stories that can't be told in other ways. Um, I'll introduce the members of the team, they're all here at Art and Code. They look a little bit more fleshy than this, but these are the masks that we don when we enter these virtual worlds as explorers and creative practitioners. So uh, technical director Alexander sitting next to me. Um, Yasmin is also here in a panel tomorrow. And Mei Ling, who many of you met last year when she was here for the workshop. Um, so uh, to provide Scatter's point of view and our, our perspective, I'm going to hand it over to Alexander for the next bit. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so one of the things that we think about when we are creating these kinds of stories is thinking of uh, the opportunity that the work represents, where we don't necessarily have to 
kind of recreated or re-sculpted. In many cases, we can actually sort of rely on the world itself. And we, we think of um, capturing and 3 scanning the world itself as an opportunity to, to sort of treat that as, as the, the sort of material of our creation. Um, and what that means is um, we, when we are creating stories, we are trying to create documentary stories. We're trying to, to tell sort of true stories, human stories. And, and we focus on capturing real captures of people in real places uh, and real stories. And for us, this is just sort of our particular focus, uh, but this is fundamentally what inspires us. Uh, and in doing, in doing this work, we often have to create our own tools. Um, and one of the tools that we've created is a tool called Depth Fit, which incidentally, or interestingly, was actually sort of uh, first conceived in, in this particular space. Um, and so the, the core of our philosophy is, look, the world is evolving in the ways that James described. Um, and given that, there are both new opportunities for, for tools, for technologies, et cetera, to tell these kinds of stories, but there are also new kinds of stories that can't really be told without those tools. And it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, and for us, the, the sort of core of our inquiry is, uh, how, do we, how do we dig into the stories that cannot be told any other way? Um, and so the, the projects that we create, um, the stories that we tell are inherently uh, immersive, they're participatory, and we, when we call ourselves an immersive media studio, we're defining it quite widely. And so when we're here, we are thinking of the work we've done in, in interactive installations where there's large projections on the wall to be just as much uh, a virtual reality experience or an immersive experience as putting you know, a, a headset on your face. Um, so for example, uh, a project we created um, for the Prime Minister's office, uh, the government of Dubai, where we explored a sort of imaginary future where they, um, the United Arab Emirates has a Mars base. And so given this sort of scenario, the way that we chose to create it and represent it was in an immersive dome. And again, as an immersive studio, we think of this as um, a, a, an opportunity to put ourselves inside of a virtual space. Um, and we call that the, the learning lab. Um, and so, um, in some ways, we think of um, a, again, a sort of a, a VR piece or say a, an audio tour to be just as much virtual reality um, as, you know, maybe the HoloLens or the Oculus Rift. Um, and so this, this is sort of the world that where we find ourselves. Right, um, and that's just for fun. Uh, but I sort of add that in there, right? Because there's these are known as head-mounted displays. This is sort of the, the top-level categories of these. But in some ways, it doesn't quite cut it, right? We're, as James was saying, we have all of these virtual spaces, and it, this isn't the first time we're actually peering into those virtual spaces. We've been playing video games, we've been 3D modeling, we've been 3D scanning for quite a long time. Uh, but there's something new that's occurring, and the reason I put this funny, t these kind of scuba goggles on the side, is really it's more like a window. We're starting to, to peer into these spaces, but we're using our faces to do it. And this is, to me, what's actually the most kind of novel aspect of it. It's not the first time we're looking into virtual spaces. Um, but instead of head-mounted displays, I often like to think of these more like head-mounted cameras. Uh, and I think this is a fantastic image. Um, sort of like the Proto GoPro. So, when I say a head-mounted camera, what that means is we're, and again, like forgive me for some of you who are doing this already, but really what, what's happening is we are attaching a virtual camera to our head. Um, and what's remarkable about this is that we suddenly have the opportunity to inhabit, at a human scale, uh, these worlds that we're creating uh, or these worlds that we're capturing. Um, and so just, I'm sort of reviewing to kind of get everyone up to, to speed with the way that we think about this, but right now there are of two dominant modes for creating spaces, for creating worlds in virtual reality, um, or you can think of it as worlds that can be inhabited in virtual reality, right? Uh, one conventional way of doing it is very close to photography, right? It's the, the sort of panoramic image which has been extended into the, um, the spherical video. Um, and then there's sort of this other, this other method, right? 
Uh, and I did, in, in preparing this, discover that there is a Harry, Harry Potter video game um, for PS3. Enjoy. Uh, but so there's this other sort of mode, which is um, has been around for quite a long time. People have done incredible work in, in the games industry um, in, in sort of world creation, right? But it's an incredibly manual process. So you're building geometry uh, manually to create a scene like this, piece by piece. And then you have to deal with the texturing, you have to think about the lighting, and there's sort of there's so many elements that go into making a scene that's just passable. Uh, and so what we think about is we have these sort of two paradigms where with the spherical, with the spherical video or spherical images, you have this sort of periscope opportunity, right? You can sort of spin your head around, you can look around from a central point. Um, whereas in video games, you have this sort of ultimate freedom, right? You can you can wander through large worlds. Um, but there's this sort of trade-off, right, where on the one hand, we have the, the sort of opportunity of fidelity, the, 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 these captured scenes that are sort of are relying on this tradition of photography, right? There's this incredible fidelity. We are very good at making cameras. And so when you capture an image of a scene or a video of a scene, the, the fidelity is so high, it's, it's, it is like capture of reality, right? And then on the other hand, you have this sort of incredible freedom with video games. And so, for us, we're thinking, is there something in between these two uh, paradigms where we can create, right? Where we can tell the kinds of stories that can't be told in other ways. Um, and so the, the kinds of technologies that are starting to uh, imply this are, it's kind of coming from the headsets, right? And we're going from VR headsets that give us the sort of three degrees of freedom, this rotation or kind of periscope opportunity to look around. And we're starting to get into tools like the HTC Vive that allow us to start to wander through these spaces, to walk through these spaces. And for us, we're deeply excited about this because it implies this little space, right? Suddenly the means of creation for these kinds of stories uh, are, are needed. And we've been sort of abstractly talking about these ideas for a very long time, and it's wonderful now that there's displays that demand their existence. Um, and so, this is this is sort of the scenario where we find ourselves, where we kind of we need that fidelity, we need that 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 high quality, that, that relationship to reality in order to tell this, these true stories or these real documentary stories. But we need the sort of underlying geometry, we need the the opportunity to put it into these these worlds. Um, this is my dad. Um, I'm sort of imagining that this is this is sort of the future of a snapshot, right? It's it's a uh, It's like a little memento that I will keep with me. Um, so we're seeing that th these sort of evolutions that I'm describing are offering this incredible opportunity to create the kinds of stories we were talking about before, where they are both deeply linked to the world itself, but we have the opportunity to tell these the stories that might occur in, in virtual spaces or might occur in the relationships that James was talking about. Uh, and so that's what we're going to get into now. So I think the, the promise is, is that if we can marry these two worlds of the fidelity of the captured image and the interactivity of the video game, then we will actually be able to transcend into this evolution of storytelling where this new way of interacting will be uh, something that becomes natural and desired because we can relate deeply to the human experience. So I want to bring you back to uh, this image. Um, this has been an inspiration when I first saw this. Uh, in, 2010, and uh, really the, the this idea of a, a distributed social network that you could see, that you could inhabit through data visualization was the impetus for uh, our, our practice, my own uh, artistic journey, my first stab into uh, exploring the telling stories with these with these techniques. Uh, and it kind of happened by accident. So this, this project was called Clouds, and it's actually conceived in this room. Um, uh, Josh Blake was here. Uh, was there anyone else who was here that, that time? It was good. We turned over some people. But, um, so it was actually conceived at Art and Code 2011 at the advent of the Microsoft Connect, the first uh, commodity 3D scanning device that could be hacked and programmed by artists and, and designers and technologists that gave way to a, a whole world of, of exploration that feels a lot like what is happening right now with VR and again the sort of impetus behind this conference um, uh, reoccurring again five years later. 
So uh, it's a wonderful homecoming. And this project's also on display at the Via Festival. You'll, you can see it tonight. Um, but so Clouds was uh, inspired actually at a hackathon in this room um, where uh, my collaborator, Jonathan Menard, and I uh, thought, could we use this new technology, this 3D scanning technology, not as a device to interact with people, or sorry, to interact with computers, but rather as a lens, a new lens to, to look at the world. And the community of people who had made this device available to be explored with, the Microsoft Connect, uh, were um, hackers themselves. They're artists that work with code and create expressive images with code. And so the, it's lonely to be an artist that works with code in a lot of ways. One, because you're interacting with people online. There's not that many of you. You live all over the world. And also, two, uh, there's a, there can be a bit of a coldness and an inhumanity to uh, technology-driven art, especially code-driven art, which is quite mathematical. But now that we have cameras that work through code and create three-dimensional images of, of the world, could, could that not be used as a, uh, a method for a data artist to make a self-portrait? And a, a, lar a large part of that, uh, the impetus for clouds came from that concept of what is it like for an artist who works with computation to represent themselves. And if they did have a way of representing themselves, perhaps then in some cyberpunk future of the world, they would be able to actually coexist with their creations. The, the generative art that they create, they could actually wield and exist in those spaces. So um, making a portrait of uh, the individual artists and then eventually the community of artists that work together and share code online uh, became the basis of a, of a documentary that ultimately took four years to uh, shoot and complete. And I'll show you just a, uh, a, a preview of that on the screen. In general, everyone in this community is used to sharing in some way. Humans are connecting from across the planet and creating something larger. I think you can equate building a tool and building a language. It's almost like people across the planet are dreaming together. over 10 hours of edited footage with over 40 different artists, technologists, theorists in this, in this space that relate to the contextualization and aestheticization of computation uh, and that research. And so the, the documentary takes the form of a video game, of an interactive application that you can run on your desktop or in VR, and it's actually built by the artists themselves using the toolkits that they create and share. So it's built in open frameworks. Um, and the source code itself for the documentary itself is available online. And the experience of watching the film is much less like watching a documentary as it is as, uh, exploring a, a database. So you can see on the left here are all the uh, topics of conversation that are touched on by uh, the artists through their, their dialogues. And uh, this interface allows you to explore how they've been spatialized within a, a web of ideas, a network where similar ideas are placed next to one another and you can sort of dive in and zoom in on a topic or zoom out and kind of get the overview effect. Uh, if you need to, you can view um, an individual artist if you're interested in uh, pursuing, you know, one person sort of catch, catches your interest uh, or curate, drive, you know, inspires your curiosity, um, you can select from a visualization of the Twitter conversations that all the artists uh, were in in conversation over the time of making the film uh, that we spatialized into a network and you can see how actually active online this this community was and the sort of relative positions of of the different people were um, kind of related to how they would cluster amongst similar ideas you know data visualizations over there where generative art may be um, on the other side of this of this nebula and the the documentary itself actually became a, a home, uh, almost an exhibition or gallery of uh, the works themselves. So it's one of the only places that you can get original interactive works by uh, uh, Satoru Higa, uh, Casey Rees, um, Chantel Martin, and Zach Lieberman were all commissioned to contribute code to the documentary that they could then, that had been generative and these modules can be uh, conjured up within this, this space. 
So just a few examples. Uh, we, we really wanted this project to, to kind of expand beyond the sort of gallery setting and work outside of the sort of con being contextualized as an art piece. So uh, we worked with film distribution, with sort of a film distribution mentality, even though we were distributing, distributing interactive software. So we thought this would be a cool new DVD. It's a gla laser etched uh, glass thumb drive that contains the entire 10 gigabyte um, documentary on it, all the code, all the interviews, and the installer so that you can bring this up on your own laptop. Um, so these are available online in limited edition. Uh, and it's also available in VR. This, this project was being made actually concurrently with the advent of this next generation of head-mounted displays. Um, so this is actually one of the ways I met Yasmin, our new partner, was that she was Instagramming our uh, project. I was like, wow, that's cool. Who's this person? Um, so uh, this was something that was an exciting new lens to uh, look at this project through. So it works on a screen, like a video game, and it also is available in VR. And so uh, I was on a personal journey making this project, you know, interviewing a lot of luminaries, people I respected, being a young member of this community, and kind of given the privilege uh, and burden to try to represent them with this project, I was, I was able to spend a lot of time sitting and talking with uh, luminaries from the field. And one quote actually stuck to me, out to me the most from all of my discussions that I think drives a lot of uh, what Alexander and I are doing at Scatter with DevKit today. And this was Kevin Slavin. He's uh, at the MIT Playful Systems Group, um, former founder of Area Code, uh, and just general media theorist. You might have seen a, a TED talk that he gave called uh, How Algorithms Shape Our World, which is very popular, about um, maybe two or three years ago. And we, Kevin was talking, kind of just rambling about uh, what the future of art will be and how technology is affecting that and how that affects the role of the artist in culture. And he said, the shift that will happen will be from artists making things that reflect their vision of the world towards artists making tools that allow other people to see as they see. And this was profound to me because I always had a fixation as an aspiring artist on the, the art objects themselves, the paintings, the graphics, the videos, the uh, ways that you could translate your vision by um, publishing things. But I realized that there actually was a lot of power in the tools that we were building, and that there was an embedded aesthetic and point of view within them. So this energized me and catalyzed my thinking that even though, yes, I'm an artist, in fact, by releasing tools, I can actually expand the voice and impact of our work beyond what I would be able to do by just making one project at a time. And so. This has been an ongoing effort to combine this hybrid practice of creating work, understanding what needs to happen, um, how artists work within communities, and then going back and, and building tools, humbling oneself to be able to enable those around you. So the depth kit simply is uh, a way of taking commodity hardware, things like a de uh, DSLR or even a GoPro or a higher end camera like a, a RED, and combining it with very cheap depth sensing cameras like the Kinect and others to be able to achieve a new type of video. A video like you see in cloud that actually ex takes a model of a person moving at 24 frames a second and allows them to be placed into a virtual world kind of like a holodeck. And we want to make it easy to use. This stuff can get really complicated. So we want it to sound, sound and feel a lot like shooting video um, on your iPhone or with your SLR. So you shoot video, you bring it into an editing suite, it looks like iMovie 3D, and then you publish it uh, online or you put it into a game engine, or where, you know, many different destinations for this type of representation. And we're gonna give a little demo uh, later on of, of what that looks like in Unity, but hang tight for now, it's just an overview. Um, and we released this to the world, first as an open source project, project uh, and then as a binary for people to download, like a freeware program, um, and then eventually as now a commercial product that we're um, building much more quickly to, and we support. So uh, people made a lot of interesting um, things. The top right is Eminem. He made uh, his Rap God music video using sequences of it from the Death Kit, which was a kind of a homage to Max Headroom. I don't know how many people uh, remember that. But uh, so it, it has this kind of like niche underground back channel uh, cachet that we enjoy. Um, and so, to kind of break it down from a technical level, because this is supposed to be a workshop, um, you guys probably feel at this point you've been baited and switched. Um, 
the, the way that volumetric filmmaking works from a depth sensing perspective is that you have uh, one camera, and you met, you've all seen these kind of images of cameras, it's called frustum, coming out like a pyramid. You know, things get further away from the camera, they get smaller, um, because that's how uh, sort of folk, like perspective works. Um, and so we have these single perspectives, and even because we have this depth sensing camera on mounted to our color camera, we're able to then, in virtual reality, see the little virtual reality head uh, move up to 45 degrees around um, that person. So it's sort of like a play. If they, we walk around the back of them, the gig's up, nothing's there. It gets pretty weird. But for a lot of volumetric experiences in films, um, this actually fully in, in, encases the amount of movement that a, a viewer, you know, with their head-mounted camera, as Alexander was describing, would move within a story. And we're actually very excited because here, next to Clouds at the Via Festival, available tonight to check out at the opening, is a, a film that's made using the next generation of depth kit technology called Giant. And it's made by uh, Winslow Porter and Malid Zizek. Uh, Winslow was the producer on Cloud, so he actually helped with that. So it's his second VR project. He's actually a co-creator of this project. Um, and uh, the live action performances of this uh, VR experience were captured using the next generation of depth kit technology. And you can kind of, we can show you a little behind the scenes of what it looks like. Um, so on the left, you have the video image that's been composited away using the depth, uh, the depth technology um, in a green screen. And on the right, you have a sort of debug view, predator vision look of what the, uh, the relief, the three-dimensional imagery looks like. And then when this is combined in code, it can be composited into a, a game engine in real time to create an actual volumetric representation of a person. Um, so when added to a scene, which is also generated in a, in a game engine in real time, like a video game, um, sorry, this is quite dark. Uh, um, you get a world, and this obviously on the screen looks flat, but if you were in VR, which many of you soon will be seeing this, uh, you can actually move around and there's parallax and, and spatial perception within the space that will actually make you feel more immersed in the story. So no spoilers there. Um, go check it out. So uh, one of our biggest breakthroughs in the last year has been our ability to take this kind of transcend this glitchy aesthetic with the depth kit. So uh, we loved it with clouds. You know, back in 2011, this was the first time we cracked open this box and seen data that looked like this. And we were telling a story about artists who exist in a computational space. So it was really nice to have this low quality data that felt like early film. But in the end, if you're making, uh, trying to tell stories that aren't about code artists, which one may be compelled to, uh, you want the technology to disappear. You want it to not be about the medium, but rather the, the story. So in order to do that, there needs to be a lot of work done in software to generate higher resolution imagery. And because depth sensors are uh, in general designed for machine perception, uh, their, the, their creators tend not to really care about the quality. You know, things are changing with um, new generations of devices now that we've made a case for volumetric video in, in industry. But still today, the stuff you can buy for cheap is pretty low resolution. But we're lucky that we have film cameras out there that are very high resolution. And through intelligent software that is sort of understanding both of these different data streams and fusing them together, we can actually create a, a hybrid data format that uh, transcends both of their qualities as a sort of synergy there. And this is a big part of our efforts now um, at the studio with the next generation of the technologies of product. Um, and we are not alone either. Uh, there's a lot of people right now doing amazing work in industry and academia and elsewhere uh, making uh, what's now been essentially, we're kind of settling on the term volumetric video, um, ways of representing at high and low fidelity um, people in virtual space and beginning to tell these stories. And really, a lot of this interest has been catalyzed by uh, the, the growing interest in virtual reality technologies as a general uh, mainstream way of consuming stories. Back to the slide of the family in the television room. So. A lot of, you know, again, we're in a very speculative space. You, the, I can count the number of films that have been made with volumetric video on my hand. Many people in this room uh, are currently working on those projects, ourselves included, or working on underlying technologies that will help that. But we still haven't defined uh, how this stuff will work. So um, we'll continue with the technology side. And we maybe we can have a roundtable discussion afterwards about why are we doing this at all. So I want to break down 
we're really this from this point forward that kind of ended the uh, philosophy side of things, and it's going to get technical. So I actually would appreciate if people raise their hand and ask questions because if you're confused about something or something's uh, not making sense, then it guarantees that 90% of the audience also has that same question. So we have a lot of time today, and we can make this discursive. So just want to put that out there. Um, so the, the talk at this point breaks into two parts. We're going to right now we're talking about people. You know the, the the mainstay of the way that we understand our world. You know, Mark Zuckerberg at the other VR conference this morning was talking about how our brains are wired to think about people. So this this medium will be implicitly social. And the way that we understand people is through the nuance of their gesture and the way we interact with them in the physical world. So that means that this, this technological energy has to go into creating representations of people that uh, meet that expectation and, and sort of reflect our lived experience. Or at least that's the hypothesis. Um, and people are doing it. So there's been a lot of great work. So I want to survey the way that humans are being portrayed computationally and volumetrically throughout and everywhere that we've seen it happen, kind of build it up. So this is a portrait of Obama. Alexander, who made this portrait? Was it Tim or Paul DeBevic? Uh, yeah, I think it was a collaboration with him and someone else, but yeah. Um, so uh, very uh, advanced um, researchers uh, got uh, the opportunity to make a, a three-dimensional portrait of our, our current president. And uh, they used this thing, which you can kind of imagine, it's actually not that hard a logical leap. If you want to take a 3D picture of someone, you got to make cameras kind of all around them. Uh, and because cameras are implicitly two-dimensional, so to get that information, you first have to capture a lot of images from a lot of perspectives. And then in software, you synthesize those images together. You kind of remove the parts that you kind of overlay them together and match points and then stitch them together and weave them together through code to generate a, what ends up looking like a 3D model, like an object. You could even 3D print this. Um, and that this is a process of computer vision in general is the, the, the technology being used here, or the, the field of research, and specifically surface reconstruction or photogrammetry is uh, the underlying names of the algorithms. So there's a little photogrammetry there. Um, and so we're like, great, you made a bust of someone, you could print it, it looks very sculptural, you could put it in a museum. Uh, but what if you want to make a movie, a video? So this is uh, Lee Perry Smith. Uh, he is a photogrammetry expert. Um, you'll see his head in a lot of places. And he's been experimenting with this as well. So a similar technique, uh, but done at 24 frames a second. And you can see as soon as we start to introduce motion into this, um, a lot of the artifacts of the process, the inconsistency from frame to frame, start to become uh, obvious. But there's a lot of work being done, again, in industry and research institutions towards uh, making that, calming that process down, smoothing it, smoothing it, making it more pleasing to the eye so that we get imagery of real people uh, in virtual space that can be, uh, again, less distracting to watch. Um, so an image like this, uh, this is a company called AI. They're based out of New Zealand and LA, um, are, are very advanced in their process of making these 3D representations of people. And their stages look a lot like this. Um, we're talking about capture at the scale of architecture. Because you saw that uh, image of Obama, well, as soon as you want to start capturing the entire person, um, it begins to be that the more you want to capture, the more cameras you have to add, and it becomes very elaborate and expensive. Now, we're lucky that uh, there's a lot of money in this stuff, so people are able to explore. Um, but it is a bit alienating for the individual artist or uh, consumer to think about setting something like this up to make a home movie of their baby, let's say. So what we're seeing actually, and I think our POV, again, our, our depth kit and Scatter's um, commitment to uh, accessibility, we found a different road through almost by accident by working with depth sensors. But we now understand a little bit about how that uh, perspective differentiates us from other ways of capturing and maybe pointing towards a future that hasn't quite arrived yet. So I'm going to hand it over to Alexander. So uh, kind of concurrent with this category of research and, and, and 3D capture that James is talking about, this kind of maximalist, multi-camera uh, capture domain, kind of 
simultaneously, there's this whole other effort, which was actually solving a different problem uh, originally. Um, and that problem is more like, it's less about what is the shape of the world in front of me, it's more like, where am I in this world? Or, if, if it's like, as I'm phrasing it, it's like, where's my robot? Where's my, where's my drone, et cetera? And so it's, it's more about uh, what's called localization um, and understanding what, where am I uh, in the world around. And in, in order to make that possible, um, you actually do need to understand the shape of the world around you, right? And so if, if you're gonna avoid colliding with something, you actually have to know that there's a wall there. And so when James was talking about the connect, it kind of emerges out of this category of research that's, that is, uh, by its nature, it's a lot faster. So I can't, you know, sort of set up my massive multi-camera stage, take one 3D scan, and then decide where to take my next step, or, you know, which turn to take, right? I need to actually know at, at a, a scale that's a lot closer to human perception, right? And so when, we, when we're talking about film, the kind of, there's this threshold where things start to become uh, fluid, um, somewhere around 24 frames per second. So these same techniques need to have that same fluidity. And so as a result, people have, or um, largely companies and, and researchers have created the means to do this. And so for us, um, we were incredibly excited when it went from like this kind of strange hybrid research device on the left to something that was basically the same kind of thing uh, but put into sort of this sleek plastic case uh, and released. Uh, and so this is the, the, the sort of first connect, uh, which came out I think November 2010. Um, and there's this sort of amazing opportunity where all of this incredible research uh, in computer vision was sort of packed into this one device. Um, and so what was interesting about it was it was sort of designed for one particular thing, right? It's like a hands-free device. It's siblings are, are like the you know, television remote and the Wii, you know? And, but incidentally, in looking at this, James and I and, and many other people saw that as a byproduct of, of its capability to see a, a human's form and, and identify where a shoulder is or an arm is, as a byproduct of that, uh, it's also this kind of future camera, right? It's this kind of computational camera. Uh, and we start to see these images come out of this device, uh, these kind of three-dimensional images that are enabling what we're, what we're doing now. Um, and I want to dive into just, just for those of you who haven't used these kinds of tools, just what is, what, so if this is a camera, what are the images that this camera creates, right? Um, so this, on the left, is a depth map. Uh, and this is a certain way of, of representing uh, the space in front of a camera. And it's, it's all sort of relative, right? It's, it's, it's in terms of the perspective of the camera, where anything that is white is closer to the camera, and anything that is closer to black is farther away from the camera. Uh, and this, I'm just sort of, my intention here is like to give us a sense of, of legibility of these things, right? So it's a, a new kind of uh, image where it's, it is, as James was saying, it's not designed for humans to read or humans to enjoy. Um, but it's really for a, a machine to interpret. So taking that depth map, uh, and this isn't the same image, it's just sort of coincidentally similar. Taking that depth map, you can sort of extrude it or push it out into space, and you start to go from this kind of 2D to something that's closer to what people confusingly call 2.5D, right? You start to be able to push it out. And the analogy I often use uh, is like one of these kind of, you know, these uh, pin cushion. Pin, yeah, sorry, pin, pin screen um, kind of toys. And so, uh, and so that is sort of what happens. If you think of, if you think of it on the left, if something is white, your, your pin is, is sort of short, and if it's black, it's, it's long. And as a result, you start to be able to build 3D models of scenes. Um, and so the sort of next stage for us was we're starting to think about, OK, so we, we've captured one single side of something. But what if we sort of, what if we do need to see the back? What if we not need to see the sides? Or if, as James was saying, it's like when you sort of peer around the back of a human being, what if you need to have a back there instead of nothing, right? And this was sort of the next stage for us. And it's kind of concurrent with things like the HTC Vive, where suddenly we're giving people the opportunity with these you know, face cameras, virtual face cameras, to actually walk around spaces. Um, and you start to, you're, you're sort of suddenly required to actually put something behind, right? Uh, and so 
the kind of the next um, stage for us is we're starting to to merge multiple views, right? And this allows us to build these kind of full representations of people. And for us, this is kind of the, the, the research. This is what we're excited about. It's what's coming next. Um, and for us, we're, what's remarkable about this is that instead of these, you know, sort of massive 100 camera um, kind of architectural cameras, as James was saying, uh, we can use numbers like one or two or four to capture a single thing. And it's sort of for us, it's, it's approaching the level where you can be fluid and creative. And someone who's maybe actually a filmmaker and an expert <coughs> storyteller in that domain can start to actually uh, manipulate these kinds of, of images, these kinds of uh, 3D models. And so we're going to show you just a, a, a kind of a glimpse into what does it mean to take assets like this uh, into the tools that we typically use for representing spaces. And so we're going to show you some of these assets inside of a game engine. Um, and I think our, our sequence is a little... That would be fine. Um, but so we're going to show you just some assets um, in a game engine called Unity. And there are many, there are many game engines, there's sort of two leaders. Uh, we, we use Unity, there's, there's a, another tool called Unreal. And what we're doing is, I was sort of describing these two worlds, where we have the kind of film side, we have the video game side. We are using the tools that people have created in order to make video games, and they've done an extraordinary job of it. We're using those tools in order to make VR experiences generally, right? So we're, I just want to show you these images inside of, of a game engine. Um, do you want to do this? or? Um, let's see. No. Um, pardon me. Um, so I'm going to show you a, a scene, and this is this is very much a, a sort of not art. It's like a demo, um, but it's showing you kind of what what can be done with these kinds of worlds. And so, oh, it looks like you guys aren't seeing this already. He's working on that project as well. Um, and we have, uh, so we have Ray in this virtual scene, right? And so the scene has been modeled, uh, but Ray is actually a sort of more like footage, right? The hard, sort of hard to navigate with this thing. So then we have another one, and um, this is it's a woman named Molly, um, and she's, she's from another of our projects. But the, sort of the opportunity here is that since each of these are kind of discrete objects, like we can we can move something like the couch, right? Um, but we can also move our people. And man, sort of yeah, I have to. You know, And so, kind of, like, what's kind of revelatory for us is that these are sort of they are objects in the scene that we can then kind of manipulate. Um, and so, so I can take this this object and I can this person and rotate them or scale them or move them around. And you start to get into something like this is not filmmaking, right? Traditionally, uh, but there's something similar. You can start to build or kind of choreograph scenes using this, these tools. Can you show from the camera perspective? Mm -hmm. And so the other thing is that, um, and this is, this is someone who is uh, sort of behind me here, uh, like this. Um, and so, as James was saying, you kind of, when you peek around the back with this the single camera stuff, you, you start to see that there's nothing there. But there's this sort of opportunity, and this is what they take advantage of in Giant, um, to, when viewed from this kind of, viewed from the front, um, 
they they start to become this sort of like three. So you have um, you have this person playing like a like a piece of footage right inside of this, and so this is kind of the world that we're starting to explore. Um, and this can obviously be viewed in virtual reality; it can be seen in augmented reality, and also sort of in standard kind of uh, standard interactive paradigms, where the web or etc. So for us, this is kind of the domain that we're exploring. Uh, James wants me to show you the reflections. Um, so. Part of, part of what the, the question starts to be like, okay, so we, we have these elements, we have the people, we have the world, how do you kind of integrate, how do you mesh the two of them? Uh, and so one of the opportunities here is we can, um, we, we can cast shadows, we can, uh, the people can reflect in the floor, we might be able to see this. Um, very subtle, but you start to be able to kind of, what I'm getting at is you can, you can really merge these people with the world around them. Um, and of course, this is sort of this is kind of the raw elements of the opportunity to tell uh, stories in this in this format. Um, is there anything else you want me to show? Okay, so let me I'm going to kind of tidy up here and put my presentation back up. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Were each of those characters filmed with one depth? Camera? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to clarify, they each one of those was filmed with one camera, uh, and, and the next project I'm going to describe starts to merge multiple cameras. Um, but it's, for us again, simplicity is really important with this, and what that means is you can literally take this single device that looks just as strange as that camera over there, um, and you can take it with you, you can take it on site, you can take it home, you can you know, take it abroad, and you can create these kinds of images, these kinds of stories. So, um, so I'm now going to talk about another project um, that we're working on, and this one is, this one is very much in progress. Uh, but it's one we're very excited about. And it, it merges for us um, out of a few different experiences. So first of all, we're seeing that um, with virtual reality, there's this kind of implicit opportunity to take you far away, right? To take you to Mars, to take you to a desert island, to take you to the top of a mountain. Or for us, we're thinking, what? It's, it's almost like, is our world around us is probably enough. It's strange enough. It is extraordinary enough. What if we actually take ourselves sort of radically close to home? And so we chose to focus on our city, um, and specifically our trains. And, and we had this, James and I actually shared this experience during um, Sandy, uh, during the storm in New York, that knocked out the power. Um, and there's this incredible social shift where typically New Yorkers are kind of um, brusque. It's like you're always in a rush to get somewhere, even if you're just standing around. And as a result, people are sort of alienated from each other. But during Sandy, we're sort of we were wandering through the city, and it seemed as if everyone around us was a different person. People were starting to engage. Since we we're all sort of distracted by what was happening, there was this uh, kind of intimacy that was was actually very distinct and very unique. And so, for us, it's sort of there's a kind of tragedy to the fact that a, a dramatic sort of act of God has to occur for us to have that kind of closeness, or, or even just communicate at all, right? And so the, the scene that we set up was, um, you find yourself on the New York City subway, and the power goes out, the lights go out, and you find yourself with a group of people where suddenly you're not just passengers on the train, kind of like ships in the night passing each other, you are suddenly surrounded by people that you're going to have to change, the, the to experience the situation with. And so, the lights go out, the people around you are sort of engaging or dealing with this, the, the, the revelation of the train going, it's breaking down. And you, as, as your eyes adjust to the darkness, you start to be able to hear these kind of mutterings, the, the, the nervous um, asides of people trying to deal with what's happening, questions and, and concerns. And as you start to look around, you realize uh, lights will sort of um, start to shine on people when you look at them, and, and you'll realize that what you're, what's actually happening is that you're hearing inside of their minds. You're starting to hear their internal monologues, how they're dealing with the situation they find themselves in, and more specifically, how they, do they deal with situations like this, where they are trapped, where they're stuck, where they have to overcome boundaries to, to engage with people around them. So as you start to, to engage with a, with a specific person around you, you 
the, the world around you starts to fade away and there, the sort of anecdote emerges that where they're telling a particular story and your this sort of train environment is replaced with the world of their story. So for example, um, one of the people that we interviewed is, a, is an actress and she had this incredibly visceral uh, and sort of <coughs> anxious experience where she was on stage uh, presenting a famous Beckett play called Not I, where the whole play is just a light on a mouth and a monologue. And she lost her words. She couldn't think of her lines. And so there she is, with the light on her, dealing with this anxiety. And you, as the viewer, are standing there with her on stage next to her, hearing her retell that story. So that is, this, that is the world of, of Blackout. And in order to make this, we've done interviews with 27 people so far. We're going to do probably another 27 again. Um, in order to sort of construct this story. And we're shooting with this multi-camera uh, system. But what I want to focus on, which I'm going to skip there. So this is just some of our cast. Um, so what that allowed us to do is sort of to put people into these worlds. And these are sort of sketches of what the experience is actually going to be. Um, in New York, I don't know if you have them here in Pittsburgh, we, there's, there's this community of amazing dancers on the subway. Um, these guys are called the, uh, they call it the, sort of their dance style light feet. Um, and so this is a group of light feet dancers uh, who are on our train. Um, and the opportunity of this is you start to be able to create these, these sort of social scenarios. Um, so what I'm getting at here though is I want to start to talk about the world building. Where James was talking about the capture of human beings, how do we build the worlds around them? Um, and how do we bring the same kinds of philosophies of, of wanting this fidelity but needing this freedom uh, to this aspect of it? And so um, we have uh, sort of two dominant paradigms for building worlds um, in, in video games and, and, vis and visual effects. They're sort of like either you 3D model it, which is an incredibly manual process. You can think of it as starting from nothing and adding to it until you get all of the complexity, all the detail, the fidelity that you need in your scene. Uh, and then by contrast, you have this other domain, which is uh, 3D scanning. And oftentimes, it's, it's sort of unstructured information. It's, it's chaotic information, where you usually have way too much. Um, and you actually have to reduce it, right? So you go from too much down to the amount you need. Um, because oftentimes, you're dealing with inherent constraints on the viewing side, where you can't just throw all of the information at it. You need to present just enough um, just to, enough to make it compelling, based on the, the limitations of, of computers and devices. Uh, so I want to talk about, and, and we're sort of getting into the workflow aspect of it, and I'm using Blackout as, as kind of an example. So this is the sort of 3D modeling, nothing to, sort of additive approach, where you use tools like, like Maya, there are other ones, there's Blender, Cinema 4D, et cetera, et cetera. You're using these tools, and it's, it's very, it is, in, it is sculptural, right? You are adding to this thing. And so, the sort of, the trade-off you're always dealing with when creating these, these worlds is make sure that you're using the appropriate tool to represent the appropriate object, right? And so, there's something about uh, the trains themselves, which is that they, are, they were fabricated, right? They were fabricated using very similar tools. And so, as a result, you have these flat surfaces, you have repeating objects, repeating shapes. And so, there's they actually lend themselves very well to 3D modeling. Um, and so the process that we went through, uh, and it's very important to do this for VR actually, is to, like, so I went into the train itself, I took a measuring tape, and I measured everything. And I got a lot of strange looks. Um, because at first I was like, oh, I'll just go when the train is empty. And then I realized there is no time when the train is empty. Uh, so I, I found myself sort of saying, oh, excuse me, and, and measuring the seat underneath someone, or saying, excuse me, I'm sort of measuring the diameter of a pole that someone's holding. But it's very important to be able to have that human scale, because this is sort of the one of the subtle cues that people, when they're actually viewing a virtual reality experience, one of the things they'll pick up on. And when it works, it will disappear, but when it doesn't work, uh, they will just notice it. Um, and so in this case, I sort of create these reference drawings. I, I note all of, the, all of the scales, all the shapes, how tall things are, how how wide things are, etc. Um, you sort of become 
uh, fixated on the object that you're modeling. And then you have to start from the bottom and you model it up. It takes forever. Um, so then you have only the object, right? There is no sort of surface. There's this, in this case, it's like this generic kind of clay texture to it. But the next stage is you have to actually have to design surfaces for these models. So uh, and there's something very, as a little sidebar, um, my background is as a photographer, and, and when you start to, as, as when you start to really get obsessed with photography or video, etc., you start to see the world through the lens of your tools, right? So you start to think about framing, etc. When you start to do modeling, you start to look at a window, at the floor, etc., very, very carefully. There's all of these properties to the way that re uh, light reflects off of surfaces, and you actually have to become both an expert in the physics of that. Um, and an artist in creating those. And so we use a, we use a tool called uh, the sort of suite of tools uh, by a company called Algorithmic, um, which is um, we use substance designer and substance painter. And if you think about it, metaphorically, we're, we're painting on these surfaces at this point. Uh, and for some of you, this will be very familiar, and others I think will be. Um, and so like when we look at a scene like this, um, there's sort of so many layers to the representation. And this is just kind of a fun sort of debug gif I made where it's, it's all these different ways of viewing the layers that make a sort of quote-unquote normal looking scene possible. Uh, things that deal with the reflectivity of a surface, things that deal with the bumpiness of it, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And so you start to have to become an expert in this when you're modeling in this way. Um, but the sort of benefit, this one's a little bit grainy, but the benefit is you start to be able to get these metallic surfaces and reflective surfaces and all of this stuff. Um, so that's sort of like one side of, of world building for these kinds of explorable worlds. The other side is this kind of reductive one where you start with too much geometry. And what this is representing is um, sort of these lines represent any given facet on the surface, right? And so you, you, can, you have these opportunities to create, to capture scenes, um, but the, suddenly the, the sort of reduction of those scenes is your problem. And so in this case, um, the tools we used, we, we focused on photogrammetry, what James was talking about, except instead of taking many cameras and capturing one static moment, you take a single camera and take many captures of an object. And so the difference there is you're getting all of those views, you're sort of just doing it over time, right? And so for, um, for Blackout, and this is like very much a work in progress, sort of a sketch, for Blackout we did that in this train station. We start, we, we walked around and we captured, we 3D scanned the spaces in the, in the subway. Um, and the opportunity there is that we, we get to both use the, the surface information, this color, this, this photographic color information, as a texture on top of these surfaces. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the kind of constraints. So you always have to choose the tool for, um, for the, the surface or for the scene. Um, and I'm just going to point out a couple of things that, about photogrammetry. There is no, and there is never, a single solution for any of this. Um, so you oftentimes have to think about the appropriate tool for the job. So there's, um, in, in terms of the way photogrammetry works, the sort of first stage is it's identifying many features. And what a feature is, is in, a, in an image, sort of like a corner or a very specific, a recognizable shape. Uh, and then what it does is it says, OK, I've identified one little patch, one little corner. Let me go find that corner in all of this, these other images, all the images I've been provided. And once you've done enough of that, you start to build up a structure. Um, and from that, you get, uh, remember the image before where you have all of these points and lines, and um, you basically get those corners from this process, and you start to be able to build up this, this view of the world. Um, so just to sort of talk about workflow, the kind of structure of this. Um, we are, again, using this philosophy where we want to take advantage of the, the opportunity of cameras, but the freedom of video games. This is sort of the way that we end up working, where we use photogrammetry tools like, uh, there's a tool called Photoscan, there's another one called, kind of, uh, sort of boringly called Capturing Reality. Um, and we use those tools to, to scan objects and scan scenes. Oftentimes, you want to focus on scenes that are organic, where there's a lot of these features, a lot of noise. So it's something like a tree or a nature scene is just full of kind of this kind of chaotic organic texture and information, whereas a flat wall is not. Um, so we create these environments either either by 3D modeling or by 3D scanning, and then we capture with DefCon. We sort of merge these two streams together uh, in a game engine, uh, and you then have the opportunity to kind of 
export that for virtual reality or for interactive platforms by way of review. Um, so the next thing that we want to get into, so we have another project here, and this is, um, do you actually want to take this one? Okay. Take it away. <laughs> So I guess there's a bit of a history of generating our projects that are relevant to this uh, at the studio. Um, specifically, the studio for creative inquiry has been very supportive of this aesthetic research. And so last year, uh, I came with uh, my partner Mei Ling and then one of our artists in residence at the time at the studio named uh, Zee Schneider. Uh, and we wanted to take these world building technologies and uh, put them in the hands of uh, museum curators and students and think about uh, what we could we do that goes beyond reality and goes beyond just trying to create a perfect representation of the world and instead embraces the fact that hey even though these uh, if you do these scans quickly they'll be imperfect but maybe that's okay if you do something other that's uh, else with them that embraces their imperfection um, so this just as a uh, an aside this project is also on view um, at the VR salon tonight. And it's the world premiere from a year ago. And um, I also say Irene was one of the uh, major contributors to this project, both as a, in capturing as well as later on. So uh, you'll, you can thank her. And there's a big team of people worked on it. We kind of passed it, it was like hot potato. Uh, <laughs> so this was a collaboration again between our studio, this studio, and then the studio at the museum across the way, the, this, this the innovation studio in the Carnegie Museums, um, which is both contemporary art as well as uh, natural history, which provided a, a wonderful canvas for capturing uh, interesting objects. So the exquisite museum, why do we call it that? Well, there is a ancient, not really ancient, there's a uh, parlor trick or sort of parlor activity that was popular during the sort of Dada or Surrealist period in France called Exquisite Corpse or Exquisite Cadaver. And many of you are probably familiar with this, even if you don't know the origin of it, but uh, often you'll see a piece of paper folded up as if it were an accordion. And then uh, each uh, people kind of sitting around in a parlor and you will draw, say this, you're the first person you draw a head, you know, some crazy head. and you don't show anybody your drawing, and then you end at the end with just the lines of wherever your, your drawing of the figure ends, and then you fold that over, you pass it to the next person. So they get no idea of the style or the kind of tone that you drew with, or, but they know where to connect from, and so they draw the next part. Maybe it's the torso or bust, and then downwards all the way down the body to the feet, um, and then when you unfold it, you get these beautiful, strange, hilarious, humorous, co collaborative drawings that were all made uh, without awareness of the other person's contributions. Um, and it becomes this kind of artwork in and of itself, but with no real author. Uh, and we find this to be a beautiful metaphor for how uh, our, our own lives go around sort of awkwardly bumping into and yet occasionally connecting with uh, those around us to create sort of mosaic that is our lives. So uh, we have a tradition in the studio with using this as a basis for um, kind of the other projects. So we thought, what if you could apply this exquisite corpse idea to a museum and actually take all the elements and artifacts and sort of translate them from the museum using this technology and then uh, reimagine them in a museum where every artist is contributing their own room. Um, and we had a few references that inspired that specifically. So uh, this was done, actually, another hackathon in 2011 by uh, Eric Berglund and Clement Bala. They made a project called Iconoclash, where they were actually able to use the, uh, the panorama tool of Photoshop. Wasn't that what it was? Yeah. yeah. And take, they, they, the Met had recently released all their artifacts, and they were, um, the art, these artifacts were uh, photographed in an extremely consistent manner. It's the same lighting, the same background, super high resolution. And so if you fed these uh, images into uh, the tools that Adobe had designed to create panoramas, you would get these unbelievably strange, but somehow partially believable mixtures of objects from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which of course surveys art from most of human history. Um, and so you get these figures of gods and creatures being mixed together in a way where 
uh, thousands of hours of engineering had gone into making it as believable as possible, sort of stretching the boundaries of these artifacts. So uh, we didn't want to do this project without giving a hat tip to Clement and Eric, um, who did, did this project prior. Another artist that uh, is a big inspiration to this project was um, uh, Fred Wilson, not the venture capitalist, he's the artist. Uh, so he made, he's done a lot of projects um, engaging with the museum actually as a canvas and the politics of the museum and curation as his medium. So this, uh, these busts of Nefertiti, um, a caustic gradient, is a commentary on the ambiguous and often miscategorized race of, of uh, the Egyptians. Uh, often portrayed as white in uh, common, you know, modern culture, but obviously that's not historically accurate. Um, and then another one, which is uh, uh, silver, Victorian, the sort of politics of Victorian silver. When we think of Victorian silver, we think of uh, the sort of cups and goblets and tea sets that were so exquisite, but silver was also used as slave shackles. And this is something that he was um, given free range to uh, the Museum of the Maryland Historical Society to not add or remove any artifacts, but to create political commentary by simply re-juxtaposing different uh, elements within the museum against one another to create commentary. So the museum already had these slave shackles as well as um, these got, you know, this, these tea sets, um, and by putting them next to each other, uh, a very powerful image is created. So together with Irene and everybody, we gallivanted through the museum. This is the Hall of Sculpture. If anybody hasn't been over there, you should go. Um, and you can also see it in VR tonight. Uh, and so we took a journey through the museum. And uh, we captured objects. And then we came back to this room. And we took those objects. And almost like at the end of, uh, you know, when you go Halloween trick-or-treating, everyone just dumped their objects onto the table and it kind of spilled out about them. Just, this is a metaphor. And we all were like, oh, that one's nice, this one's nice, and they picked them up, and then everybody had started building their, these rooms. And uh, the rooms were quite exquisite. Um, this is a panorama photo, this is untreated, this doesn't have Irene's wonderful light. Look, I just saw her face when I shared this image. Uh, the lighting is done much better, we, we didn't have time to take, the, this is a, a work in progress, so um, you will see that the, the uh, it's museum tonight, and you actually travel through it at human scale. And so, we were able to, um, each, each contributor uh, created a room, curated the objects, and then created an artistic statement that was about why they put those objects together. So um, I, I encourage everybody to explore that humorous environment. Um, but again, embrace the sort of the, the interesting thing to us is that this world building is not about just the um, accurate representation of reality, but then being able to take that suggestion and take it one step further into things that um, maybe conceptually more interesting and go beyond the way that we uh, can interact with objects in the real world. Um, so yes, this is premiering at the VIA Festival tonight. Um, so a bit of a segue now, take a deep breath. Uh, we, didn't, we, just, we didn't have a very good transition on this one, did we? So video games, so, uh, <laughs> so this is all, you know, we're working in an art context, we're doing this weird experimental stuff, and we're like, Oh, inner stories you can interact with, that's crazy. And meanwhile, for the last 40 or 50 years, there's been an industry that is now bigger than the film industry that is making interactive stories. And they're called video games. From Mario all the way to Grand Theft Auto, and now um, exploding outwards, it's important as we work even within where we think maybe we have a more high and mighty opinion of the stories that we're telling because we're not, uh, we're sort of consider ourselves appealing to a broader demographic. The truth is that uh, video game technology and the thinking ar around the way to use interactivity to um, make compelling emotional experiences is, is quite developed, um, both on an industrial scale as well as an artistic scale. Um, but again, today we're couching this in the capturing of reality, the, the thinking of representations. So there, the next few examples are some emergences within the video game world that we're finding that are interesting and relate to uh, what we're doing. So. The first is a video game called The Vanishing of Ethan Carter, which was really a breakthrough game in the use of photogrammetry to make game assets. So, you know, the video game pipeline, how people generally build video games, sort of like the Harry Potter uh, reference from earlier, it tends to be artists who are modelers and, and texture artists and see people working in CG creating sort of something from nothing. 
you know, building things from polygons and adding color and texture and drawing onto them uh, to make these uh, avatars and environments. But it's true that these technologies, this, this emergence in imaging culture, like from before that I was showing you, the Apple Maps, also is very relevant to the production of games. And this was a breakthrough game in 2014 that uh, a large percentage of the environment was built using photogrammetry and done in a very expert way. And it's a beautiful game. It's on Steam. I recommend you, you download it and play it. Um, and then there's also this sort of subculture, which is becoming more and more sort of diffuse, of this idea of machinima, this idea that we can take a, a game engine, a video game story world, and instead of playing it, just sit back and watch and create sequences that uh, start to begin to play in these characters and narratives that we love because we love these games. So this is common with, there's a breakout one, um, I forget the name of it, but doing in Halo. And uh, the tools of production are beginning to mimic what we're talking about um, with film. And so I want to show you a piece of software that a lot of people may not be aware of, um, that it was a surprise for me. And just to show you this sort of against the, the language that we've been talking about for, for um, this entirety of this day, uh, how gamers, the gaming culture and the world around that is beginning to talk about similar ideas. So I want to show you the commercial that Valve made for uh, the Source Engine uh, filmmaker. The last seven years, we've been creating movies in a very different way. I'm going to talk to you today about a storytelling tool that we built inside Valve's Source Engine. We condensed the entire pipeline of an animation studio down onto a single gaming PC. We're calling it the Source Filmmaker. We built the Source Filmmaker so that we could efficiently share our creative efforts across all aspects of the entertainment experience. This means that we created all of our movies on location inside the video game world. While the movie is playing back, we can pause, reach into the frame, and change something. That's not a 2D video that you're looking at. You're looking at the 3D world of the video game. So this is just me speeding up the rest of the demo, which goes through how to actually use this crazy thing that looks like Final Cut, but it's for making machinima. So I think that the more we can cross-pollinate between these maybe culturally disparate worlds, the, uh, the faster we can move through um, discovering these new uh, processes, techniques, genres, and, and realities. Um, they even have uh, their own Saxie Awards. It's an Oscar-like uh, thing where they were the best uh, source filmmaker games with um, awards. So we're all emulating the same culture. So there's a bit of an inverted hierarchy there where the gaming industry may be uh, more lucrative than filmmaking, but there still is a cachet in the film world that uh, gamers try to emulate or imagine themselves against. Um, and then there's uh, uh, celebrity game characters, like uh, this one, the Quantic Dream is a game development studio which is really pushing the envelope of this hybrid hybrid space, um, and this is featuring Ellen Page, the Beyond Two Souls is a game where most of the uh, game is actually cut sequences and, and uh, interactivity that's been done was captured uh, from a performance of her and William Defoe. And uh, I won't play much of this, you can check it out online. Um, but an interesting thing happened, and I think, again, coming back to our studio's practice of watching where these sort of ruptures or just problematic uh, things can occur, um, there was a, a snafu with this game that was released, and what happened was there was a shower scene that featured the avatar of Ellen Page, and no, in normal cinematography, we've seen this all before, the sort of PG version of the shower scene is shot over the shoulder, it's very tasteful, um, done in a way that uh, is right for all, all audiences. However, hackers were able to get into the game's source code and get control of the camera, and they were then able to release what sort of would be uh, nude images of Ellen Page, but not really Ellen Page, because it was just her body put onto another avatar, because she was never actually photographed in a shower. She was just motion captured in a, in a, in one of, in a suit that looked like that. And the weird thing about it was the game artists had actually taken the time to make these images, the model that was ever actually shown, very anatomically correct, which uh, added to the uh, teenage appeal of these uh, strange amalgam, amalgamated virtual real uh, images. There's a, a potential lawsuit with Sony about that, how these got released, why did they render her in that way, um, even though they never intended to show it, make these, this vulnerability was there. But the, the interesting thing about this is we get into these very blurry areas where even though an actress would never give, actually gave permission or even gave her body over to a, a, a filmmaking 
scenario like this that yet somehow these can be created. And that when we're releasing systems to the world, that sometimes those systems in the same way with software, we can have unexpected results and our viewers can act against our intentions and uh, maybe do things that subvert our intentions. And, and so we need to be aware of that as filmmakers. So that's an interesting kind of uh, downturn or uh, disruptive thing that happened. Um, I'm going to pass this over to you. Sure. You might, maybe you want to say more about that last thing. I'll leave it there. I mean, I, I, I find it strange, and it, it just, it, I, I think the subtext for me is it's important to think about the, the politics of representation, the politics of bodies, that, that nothing is a political, certainly not uh, through your representations and or video games. Um, so, we're in this space, and this is kind of by way of summation, where um, we're sort of giving this new power to audiences, right? We're, we're giving people the freedom to be their own sort of cinematographers, where the, the, the traditional um, kind of hierarchy, very, very rigid hierarchy of filmmaking is starting to get disrupted. And in some ways, you know, when we put, put on a VR headset, we're all, you know, freelance cinematographers. Um, so the question for us is like, what does that mean for actually designing experiences, linear, emotive um, experiences that evolve over time? Um, and as um, as these sort of these capabilities evolve, we need we need to start to deal with these this sort of um, sorry, I'm sort of inheriting some of the slides. Here, so I'm just this. Um, um, So I, I think it's the, the sort of t idea here is that we're transcending the concept of just an audience, right? We are no longer just audiences. We're actually participants. We are, we are situated in that room with people around us. And so the traditional dichotomy between a director and the audience starts to disappear. And, and there's this wonderful opportunity where we get to both design new language and we get to design new roles for what this, this is. And so, you know, this is by, by no means our sort of final proposal, but we need to start thinking of um, the, the, the creators of these experiences less as directors, less directorial, and more as designers of experiences, right? Because a designer thinks of a situation where people have many choices, not just one. Um, and and as audiences, we are now actually sort of we're implicated, we're, we are participants, and we need to, as designers of these experiences, create situations where the audiences are, are thrilled or. Their, their sort of participation is essential to creation of the story itself. Um, so I want to get into some, as we are experimenting with this stuff, both technically and creatively, uh, just some of the like insights and, and experiences that we're having. And um, this is one thing that I encountered very recently. When researching um, a screenwriting, uh, and I heard this anecdote, which is that uh, uh, a woman who was studying screenwriting asked one of her professors, when you're writing, when you're screenwriting, what is the difference between writing for a television show uh, and writing for cinema? Uh, and her professor said, well, in the one, the people are much larger than you. And in the other, they are much smaller than you. <laughs> uh, which I think is a brilliant answer, right? It, and that is, it, it is a strange and categorical difference. But there's something strange, and I have no answer here for you, but there's something amazing about the fact that in VR, or often in AR, they are about the same size as you are. And there's something special there. And this is kind of what we're starting to explore, is it's, it's not necessarily an extrapolation of one or the other, or even an extrapolation of video games. We have to actually do new work. Um, I love this image. Uh, so the other thing is, and this might come as, this might seem obvious, but the concept of this, this rectangle is often uh, not as, as, as irrelevant as it, as it was. So for me, when I, when I started to make images, this creative constraint was actually revelatory. It was extraordinary. This is a creative palette, right? You can do so much within this constraint. Um, but we are actually sort of losing that, we're losing that constraint. Um, and so the question for us is like, as we design experiences, if I mentioned this one earlier, as we're designing experiences like that, where it is a dome that surrounds you entirely, what is the frame? 
in this context. And so, just to kind of give you a little bit of insight in the way that we think about this, when you're storyboarding, when you're, where you're planning for this kind of shooting, um, oftentimes it's less about framing, and it's less about sort of restriction of vision, and it's more about uh, something that's akin to, to choreography. And so this is, like when I was designing this scene, I had to storyboard it in this particular way where it's, it's top down, right? It's viewed from above. And in order to, to frame a scene like this, you start to have to be able to think in this way. And it, I think it's actually more, uh, there's, there's sort of references in theater and there's references in dance and choreography for this that are, that are different than, you know, references in photography or photography. Um, I'll let you take this last slide. Is it? Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, I want to end on a, on a personal note. Um, so, I was in London uh, maybe three years ago working on clouds. These are two people who were in clouds, Memo Atkin and Julia Kagansky. And we saw the Google Street View car. It drove by us. It's like a weird little smart car with a thing on the front. And we took our cell phones and took pictures of it. Um, and, uh, and then later, we sort of forgot about it. And then later, it was like somehow remembered that and said, oh, I should go back to where that happened in Hackney and see if we're there. And lo and behold, sure enough, we made the database. We were there with our faces blurred out and my shoes blurred out and uh, just and sort of ineffectively anonymized by uh, the Street View algorithms and stitched into this mosaic, this tapestry um, at this, that's the scale of the whole earth. And this screenshot, and I think if I go back, it's probably been replaced by updated imagery. I'm not sure, I haven't looked in a while. Um, is important to me, it's a snapshot. It's, a, it's an image that uh, is a moment in time that I care about. And the, I wanna leave you with the um, parting notion that let's not leave it up to these mechanized eyes to uh, make important imagery. Let's take control of these systems as artists and filmmakers and uh, tell the next generation of stories. Thank you.